Join me in Isaiah 14. You know, I started a series two weeks ago uh, called Kingdom, and the byline of the series is um, Callings, Commitments, and Combat. And so we're going to spend uh, as often as I can, I get the privilege of sitting out here a week from this Sunday, not this Sunday, but a week from this Sunday, I get to sit where you're sitting, and our co-pastor, Dustin Pennington, is going to come, and he is going to preach on the 14th. Between him preaching, all the other messages I'm going to be doing right now are going to be in this kingdom series. And what I'm trying to do, and it is strategic, I am looking uh, for every opportunity to help you, to help me keep our focus on the big picture right now. One of the dangers of the Christian life, we're going to expose a little bit of that tonight, is that in the midst of, we've got cultural change going on, we've got political change going on, some of you have personal change going on in different arenas. We obviously, as an assembly, have a lot of ministry change and personnel change and all this glorious stuff that just signifies, and it's an indicator, God is moving, God is doing something, but being the creatures that we are, we are told more often than any other command in, uh, in, in Scripture, don't be afraid. Sometimes I read it like this, stop panicking. And so because often we get distracted and we get our eyes on lesser things, my goal, I really feel like it's an assignment from the Lord right now, is to make sure we're focusing on the big picture. And so we're going to be talking about kingdom. Tonight is kind of under the combat heading. It's callings, commitments, and combat in the kingdom. And I want to do something that I almost never do. I can tell you I've been preaching 21 years, and I think I've preached maybe four messages in those 20 years, uh, 21 years that are directly focusing on the enemy. I really don't like to talk about him. I mean, he's kind of a, a defeated foe, and there's not a whole lot of um, uh, purpose, I guess, to spending massive amounts of time on him. However, the scriptures don't hide him, and so as much as the scriptures reveal the activity and intent of Satan, I'm going to do that too. And so tonight's message is called The Desire and the Destiny of Satan. The Desire and the Destiny of Satan. And what I hope to do in this message is to show you one of the reasons why Satan, and Satan representing the demonic horde, all of the forces of hell, in a fallen world system that he's the prince of, why does he come against you? Why does he come against you? Is it just that he is evil and, and just unhinged and furious? Or does he actually have a motivation for coming against the church of the living God? And I'm going to give you the answer to that rhetorical question in part tonight but because I do believe that one of the reasons he comes against you is because of your connection to the kingdom. And I want to show you that this evening. So I'm going to read Isaiah 14, and I'm going to again, uh, begin in verse number 12 this evening. And so I hope you'll follow along. If you didn't bring a copy of the scriptures, it should be up on the screen. Isaiah 14, 12. How are you fallen from heaven, O day star? Some of your translations may say, O Lucifer. Son of dawn, how you're cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. Those who see you will stare at you, ponder over you. Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world like a desert and overthrew its cities, who did not let his prisoners go home? All the kings of the nations lie in glory, each in his own tomb, but you are cast out away from your grave like a loathed branch. Clothed with the slain, those pierced by the sword, who go down to the stones of the pit like a dead body trampled underfoot. You will not be joined with them in burial because you've destroyed your land, you have slain your people. We're going to migrate into a few other passages tonight. Let me give you one important uh, aspect of Bible study. The passage that we just read has a um, primary interpretation. And that primary interpretation is that Isaiah is writing in a historical context and the prophecy is going out originally or primarily to a wicked human king of Babylon. 
That is the primary interpretation of this passage. But as you read through it and the spirit quickens your spirit to it, you realize this is much more than just an ancient Babylonian king. So much of what we're reading applies to one who was a greater rebellion than this human king. And so what we're going to find out when we import some of the New Testament as kind of expanding this teaching, I believe we're on good ground to give the prophetic interpretation. Primary interpretation is a wicked Babylonian king. The prophetic interpretation is that it is speaking towards the reality of Satan being cast out of heaven and his eventual and eternal destruction. So tonight, we get to celebrate the conquering King Jesus, and the back of the story whereby he puts every single aspect of rebellion and evil and wickedness into eternal destruction where it will never be again. That is where we're heading tonight. That is the reality of the culmination of the kingdom that Jesus Christ will rule in an uncontested dominion for all of the ceaseless ages. And so I want to encourage you about where you stand tonight in the kingdom, and I want to show you that though you're opposed, though you were fought, though the enemy is real and he's active, but the end of the story is that he is defeated eternally, and the reality in the moment is he already knows that. And so we don't need to run and flee and hide. We're going to be able to go into combat and... uh, Well, I'm excited about it, so let's get into the Word tonight. I want to start in verse number 12, and then I'm going to bring a couple of other passages to bear on what we're talking about tonight. And let's just talk about the eviction of Satan from heaven. Satan was a chief angel, if not the chief angel in in eternity past. Created somewhere during the creation, angels are not eternal themselves. They're part of the created order. God created angels. And Satan was at one time a holy angel set for the service and the glory of God. But he entered into rebellion, and we're going to find that written out and detailed a little bit here, entered into rebellion and eventually was evicted from his post in heaven, evicted from the domain of heaven. And the scriptures indicate that he took a third of the angels with him. So whatever the innumerable amount of angels were that existed originally in heaven, one-third of them rebelled with Satan, and now they make up the demonic realm, and they are the ones who are assigned to provoke, to lie, steal, kill, and destroy, and carry out the evil schemes of hell. And so we have a real enemy, but that does not mean we have an enemy that we have to tremble before. This is the testimony in verse 12. Isaiah writes, and again, the primary application to a human king, but the prophetic towards Satan. He says, how are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? O day star, one who bears light is the intention in the, in the Hebrew. And he says, how are you cut down to the ground? You laid the nations low. And so the very opening statement is Isaiah saying, you were once mighty. You were once oppressive. You were once the one who dominated the world at the time. But now, at the back end of your story, O oh son of the morning, O oh day star, you are cut down. You are fallen. So let's unpack that a little bit. Let me bring in a passage from Ezekiel 28. Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 have what I believe are prophetic references to Satan. And look in, it'll be up on the screen, Ezekiel 28, verse number 14. You were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. In the midst of the stones of fire, you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in your midst and you sinned. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God and I destroyed you. O guardian cherub from the midst of the stones of fire, Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. And the Lord says, I cast you to ground. Again, there's a primary interpretation that this is a prophecy against a human ruler. But as that Ezekiel 28 passage is open, you realize there is so much more that is being said here than just to a human king. And we get little glimpses of of what might have been. I, I wouldn't die on this hill, but I do want to tell you this. It would seem based on the teaching of scripture that Satan was a beautiful angelic creature, a powerful angelic creature, one who pleased God at some point because it says here that he was, he was wonderful in all of his ways until sin was found in him or unrighteousness was found with him. And there was a violent rebellion 
in heaven, what that must have looked like. I want you to think about this. We go through the big picture all the time, but listen, Satan and a third of the angels in one form or another rebelled against God Almighty. As a matter of fact, let's unpack a little for Revelation chapter 12. So we're going to the back of our Bibles, Revelation 12, verse 7. Now war arose in heaven. Think about that. Heaven, this beautiful place that we all want to go to, was once the point of conflict. The heavenly realm was a point of conflict between God Almighty, between his authority and power, and Satan. And now Michael and the angels were fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels, those are the demons and Satan, they fought back. But he was defeated. And there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan. That takes all the guesswork out of it. The devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. We get a peek behind the curtain. This angelic realm, the war, and it's going to happen in another sense again, but this is the eviction of Satan from heaven. And we're going to talk about what got him evicted in a moment. But I want you to recognize that there was once Satan having a place in the glorious place, having a right in the glorious place. But because of his rebellion, he was cast out, he was evicted, and he was cast to the ground. In Luke chapter number 10, verse 18, Jesus puts it succinctly. He said, I saw Satan falling like lightning from heaven. So however the dynamics played out, I don't know. I don't know all of the logistics, but I know one thing. Satan was created as all things are created for the glory of God and the worship of God and the service of God, but that wasn't good enough for him. And so he rebelled against God. He convinced a third of the angels to rebel with him. What kind of arrogance and pride and blindness must have been in the heart of these angels to look at the holy God and be with him for who knows how long before the rebellion took place and to actually think that they could come up against him? And God being God and being glorified in his wrath and his justice, didn't, it doesn't even sound like it was a, that big of a contest, just cast them to the ground after the battle with the, the holy angels that remain. Uh, why is it important to, to uh, highlight this? Well, it dovetails with what I'm going to share with you next. I want to tell you why he got evicted. There was a reason, and this reason that he was evicted from heaven is also connected to his fury against the church right now. So let's go into verses 13 and 14. We move from the eviction of Satan from heaven, and now I want to talk to you about the thirst of Satan to be king. King of what? King of it all. Satan, from the beginning, has always wanted to rule. What, if I can put it in uh, biological terms, what, what courses through his veins is rage and pride and a thirst for power. There is nothing that he does that is not aimed towards quenching his thirst for power and worship and control. That's what he wants. That's what he's always wanted. He wasn't satisfied with being a worshiper of God. He wanted to exchange positions, and he wanted to be worshiped as God. And so as we think through this, let's go through this very quickly, these verse 13 and 14. His secret desire for glory, it would eventually be exposed, but at one point it was secret within him. You, look at what God's word said. You said in your heart, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. Pride always begins there. Rebellion always begins there. Religion will seek to modify rebellious behavior, and it never works. You can shackle it, you can jail it up, you can educate it, but rebellion is not primarily a mind issue or a body issue. Rebellion is a heart issue. And so when Satan was being exposed, where does the indictment start? You said in your heart. And what was that that he said? Look at the words there. I will ascend. I've got to go higher. I've got to go higher. I've got to go higher. I need to be exalted. I need to be exalted. I need to be lifted up. I want to be the pinnacle of heaven. And he's doing this in the context of knowing that heaven already had an occupied throne. There, there, there is no uh, ignorance on the part of Satan. There is blind rebellion and pride, but he knew what he was wishing for. He was wishing to displace God off of heaven's throne so that he himself, the anointed cherub, could take that position. Now, that is the essence of pride. Pride always wants God to be lessened if there is ever a conflict between God's will and our will. 
Satan's not the only one who wrestles with pride. I dare you to confess that you wrestle with it too. We all do. But Satan had taken his to such a level that there was the point of no return. Look at his deep desire for power at the end of verse 13. He said, I will ascend to heaven. But look, he says, above the stars of God. Watch this. I will set my throne on high. Here's the problem. He didn't have a throne. Nobody had given him a throne. Nobody had entitled him to rule and to reign in the domain of God and the kingdom of God. And yet his heart now had had been so entrenched in its thirst for power and its desire for uncontested worship and rule that now he pictures himself entitled. He wants that throne for himself. He's locating it. I tell you where I'm going to put it. I'm going to put it up and it's poetic language here, granted, but it, 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 it speaks of the impulse of his heart. And he says, I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the far reaches of the north. In, in ancient pagan religion, the gods clustered together, usually on a mountain in a northern region. No matter what culture it was, they were always pictured towards the north, clustered together, ruling and reigning from the mountain. And so that language is imported here, and, and the, the words can be attributed to Satan. I will go to the highest place. I will exalt myself at the pinnacle of that high place. I am going to have this power. Why? Verse number 14 sums it all up. His damnable desire to be God. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Here we go. I will make myself like the most high. Listen, let's strip away all of the poetic language and let's get to the the rhythm of what, what, what is being attributed here prophetically to Satan. But he said this, I want to be God. I want to be God. That is, by the way, the essence of sin. The essence of sin, whether it's Satan's sin, Adam and Eve, or my sin, the essence of sin is, whether it's in microcosmic or macrocosmic view, it is, I don't want God to rule over me. I want my will asserted above the Lord's. And that happens every time we willfully transgress. It happens every time we ignorantly transgress. We are trained. We're born rebels, by the way. Aren't you glad you came tonight? Aren't you being encouraged? We are born rebels. I've said it for years. We're born little savages. We come out of the womb. We don't have to train our children how to disobey. They just know how to do it. They know how to whack each other on the head in the nursery and say, mine, mine. It's just in their hearts. Why? Because we're born rebels. The Bible says foolishness is bound in the heart of the child. And all the MSNBC people are going to get mad, but it says the, 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 the rod of correction drives it out. And so when we look at these things, friends, we're seeing that Satan was the author of rebellion. And in the temptation of Adam and Eve in the garden, what was the temptation ultimately do? Rebel against God, doubt God, distrust God, and then don't do what God says. Don't believe him and don't obey him. And so now we have the nature of rebels. And so that's why the gospel is so pivotal. It's not simply to transport us to heaven. Good night, it's to change our nature before we ever get to heaven. It's that we might reflect heaven here, but we can't do that as rebels. Satan has no shot at redemption. Hallelujah, we did. And if you haven't been redeemed, you have a shot at it tonight. What do I mean by that? It means Jesus will redeem you the moment you say, I don't want to be God. I'm not God. I don't want the throne. I've been on the throne, but I'm getting off the throne because I've met the one who really is on the throne. And so when we come to that place, we call that repentance. We call that faith. We call that yielding. And so he says, I'm going to be like God. And that was probably it. You know, I I don't understand all the dynamics of, uh, you know, prior to the creation and and man on earth. I I, I do have an imagination, though, and I've pondered this for the last couple of weeks. I'm just like, what did that war look like? You know, the, the, the teaching in Scripture, especially the Revelation passage, is very specific. There was a war in heaven. So there was some kind of cosmic, beyond the cosmic, some kind of battle in the heavenlies where um, rebellion for the first time, it was a, the original sin wasn't Adam and Eve in the garden, it was Satan and, and his demons in, in the, uh, the uh, paradise, in, in glory, rebelling against God, and it, it didn't end well. So when we get down to the end of the story, the end of this account, this is where I think we, we really need to weave this into our thinking right now and tomorrow. We, we really need to understand just how victorious we are. 
We need to walk in it. We don't just need to preach about it and amen it. We, we need to start walking in this because th- there is no greater foe than Satan. What does he come to do? The thief comes not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. That's all he's going to do. And that's what he will continue to do. And the only thing that makes that n- not uh, become our ultimate reality is the intervention of God and his amazing, astounding grace, the power of the gospel, the working of the Holy Spirit, whereby we are able to believe. And when we believe, we are translated from darkness into light, from death into life. We become a new creation in Christ Jesus. And therefore now there is no condemnation upon us, nor will there ever be. So we need to walk in that kind of victory. But even knowing that we are free, we're justified, we're saved, we're forgiven. That does not mean we are immune from his attacks. So what we must recognize is, yes, he is a defeated foe, but if we are not wise, we will operate in too close of proximity to him and his ways, and we will experience his bites and his claws. He can't destroy the soul, but he can mangle a life. And so as we're thinking about this, I don't want, oh, Jesus, help me. I don't want us to start, keep, continue to think of our relationship to Jesus as our ticket being punched to heaven. That is not what the gospel is given to us for. It's not so, whoo, man, that was close. Now, I just when I die in 60 years, I get to go be with Jesus. Jesus doesn't want you to think like that. Jesus says, in 60 years, what about now? What about in your life? What about walking by faith? What about me walking with you? What about you hearing my voice because you're one of my little lambs? What about me shepherding you? What about walking a friend that sticks closer than a brother? What about me giving you my wisdom? What about me giving you my gifts? What about me anointing you to make my name known in your generation? And and, and we've got to, friends, we've got to. We've got to pull down the stronghold that has come to many of us through our theological training and our church cultures that the gospel is simply given so somebody will pray and ask Jesus in his or her heart and then, whoo, when you die, it's going to be glorious. But then the mindset is that they live their lives independently of this one that saved him. That's not what Jesus wants. Jesus wants us actively engaged in the battle that began in a rebellion in heaven and continues right now here on earth because, yes, Satan is defeated, but he's not done fighting yet. And so let's get it in this last point here. Let's, the elimination of Satan from the story. Um, let me pull one out of one of the hymns of the Reformation. His doom is sure. His doom is sure. Let's look at verse 15 in Isaiah 14. But you are brought down to shell, the grave, hell, if you want, to the far reaches of the pit. Again, primary interpretation. Speaking to a pagan king who was once vaunted, he was once exalted, he was once powerful, he was once resourced, and the prophecy against this Babylonian king is that he would be brought down to the ground, he would die an ignominious death. We got that, but we're going beyond the Babylonian king. I'm not here for an ancient history lesson in Mesopotamia. What I want to do tonight is I want to say, no, I want you to continue, allow yourself to apply this in a prophetic way to what is going to happen to Satan. So let's go back to the back of our Bible again. Revelation chapter 20, verse 7. When the thousand years have ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog, Magog, to gather them for battle. He's still wanting to fight God. And their number is like the number of the sands of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. Tell me me what city that is. It's Jerusalem. And the, but fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And so we're going to a scene that hasn't happened. It's going to happen right here on earth. And Satan is going to demonically fuel a human rebellion and amassing of armies that will come against the the Lord's city and the Lord himself to bring one final gasp of war against that throne. 
against God's kingdom. Don't you get this? He's wanted the throne. He's, he was denied the throne in eternity past. He hates the fact that he'll never have the throne. And when the throne begins to be here on earth, at the end of a thousand years, Satan is going to come up and his first impulse is, that throne's here. I still want that throne. The throne is representative of all that is in the kingdom. And so the kingdom is not only important to God, it's not only important to the church, but it is so important to Satan that he will forfeit his eternity because he wants the kingdom. Say, Jeff, I don't get it, man. What has this got to do with anything? Well, I think that if to the degree that we begin to get this, we'll start seeing the big picture of who we are because I'm going to give you something here. You have a right and an inheritance in the very kingdom that Satan was denied. You are a joint heir with Jesus in the kingdom that God evicted Satan out of. You are a visible, eternal reminder of God's kingdom, and you will be reaping for all of eternity what Jesus has provided in this kingdom. You will be feasting in the kingdom, the very kingdom that Satan wanted to rule himself. And he was evicted from it. He's permanently denied from it. We see here that instead of the kingdom, what does he get? He gets a lake of fire and eternal torment with all who have rejected that throne that Satan once once wanted for himself. So you say, okay, well, what does this have to do with me? Because that's what Americans ask because we're me-centered. So let me tell you what it has to do with me. That's just us. We're like, all right, man, great, good, decent theology. Thanks. What, what What can I do with this? Well, friends, listen. Why does he attack our bodies? Why does he attack our minds? Why does Satan seek to work in our fellowship, in our koinonia, in the oneness that Jesus said he died to provide for us? Why is it, is it just that we are just sinful and struggling relationships or is there more to it? Now look, we're sinful and we sometimes struggle in relationships and we can make a mess of things on our own from time to time. I want to tell you, it's so much more than us not being able to get along. It is the intent of Satan to ruin everything, anything and everything that might represent God upon his throne, Christ upon his throne and the glory of the kingdom. Satan says, I hate that I'll never have it. He didn't want to just be a part of it. Yeah, you know, Think about this. He could have been a part of it. He could have been a part of it just like all the other holy angels would be a part of it for all of eternity. He didn't want to be a part of it. He wanted to rule it. So he hates the one who will rule it. He hates Jesus. He hates the the, the nation of Israel. He hates the church of the living God. Why? Because in the end of the age, these things come together in a beautiful convergence to bring glory to the one who sits upon the throne that Satan was denied. So that's why he comes against you. And to the degree that you have set your, this is going to go straight into, straight into some hearts. To the degree that some of us set our hearts for the kingdom, Satan will match his resistance against you proportionally. And so if you want, if, if listen, I'm going to tell you something that probably I don't, in the, in the natural, I don't really want to say it, but if you want to avoid the devil's fury, just be an average Christian. Just be average. Just come to church. Keep your head down. Don't don't share your faith. Don't give. Don't serve. Don't fast. Don't pray. Definitely don't witness. And just keep your head down. Just show up in the church. The devil will leave you alone. He'll leave you alone. He can't do anything about your soul, but as long as you're not growing and glorifying the Lord, you're okay. No threat to his dominion. He will leave you alone. But that's not you. I am persuaded better things of you. You see, we've got our hearts set for the glory of God, and we don't just want to go to heaven when we die. We want to be a revelation of heaven. We want God to reveal heaven through us, through our words, our actions, our relationships right now. So what do we do? Well, that's why um, 420-somethings get up on a Wednesday night or 520-something, and they're just playing for Jesus. You know, they could be doing homework, studying, working, sleeping, doing all those things. That's why right now people taking care of our little ones, and they're pouring Jesus into them on a Wednesday night after a 10-hour day at work. Why? Because they just believe the one who sits on the throne is worthy of anything that they can give. And, and so you've got this going on and on and on. Why do our brothers and sisters in, 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 in the Middle East, I have a friend, so it's Peter, he's a pastor, and uh, he's in Tanzania, he's from Kenya. 
Remember last year, him just writing me and he said, Pastor, I need some help. I've got to go back to Kenya. I don't have any money. Why do you got to go back to Kenya, brother? Well, because when they uh, stormed the mall and Boko Haram killed all of the people, seven of them were part of my church back in Kenya. I've got to go home and do their funeral. So he goes home, and I don't know if you saw the slaughtered Christians. It wasn't the mall. It was the uh, prayer, prayer thing. The, it was the college where they were gathered together in a prayer meeting. Why won't they renounce? Why won't they recant? Why are they willing to die? Why? Why? They see the one on the throne. They've met the one on the throne. The kingdom is bigger than the little K kingdom on earth. And so, brothers and sisters, I want you to, I'm, I'm telling you, this is the cure. The cure to frustration in the Christian life, the cure to bitterness in the Christian life, the cure to apathy in the Christian life is not trying harder. It is slowing down and saying, God, make your throne real to me. Make your kingdom real to me. I will do what it takes. I'll tarry here until your kingdom over, uh, supersedes this kingdom because this kingdom bombards our senses visually, audibly, just uh, intention pulls on us all the time. And if we're not intentionally saying, I'm pressing into the throne, I'm pressing into Jesus, I'm pressing in, then all that's pressing against us will end up defining us. But if we'll press through, we won't be sidetracked by these lesser things. And as you do that, as you and I determine, my life will not be average. I, I told my son, I laid hands on my son. My son had an encounter with Jesus on Friday night in the prayer meeting. I'd tell you what it is, but y'all probably write me mean emails. I mean, it was just, it's one of those things. It was just Landon just got filled. He's 10 years old. And the next thing, I, the next morning, Pastor Dustin texts me a picture. I didn't even see this. I saw my son. I was praying with my son. Dustin was over there praying, and another brother was. And they were just tearing it up on the stage. It's beautiful, just worship, and God was moving. And Landon just got filled. And... I don't know what I did. I was just probably in a zone somewhere. But the next morning, Dustin sends me a picture, and it's a picture of my son laying hands on another little boy, praying over him, and the other little boy had his hands on top of him. They were on their knees in a corner somewhere. And I'm thinking, yeah, come on, go Jesus, amen. But I tucked him in that night. This was before I even saw the picture. I tucked him in that night. I, this is what I, I told my son. Not because he's my son, but because I see the mark of God on him. You won't be average. Never live your life average, son. Never live average. And I just tell you, you're not my boys and you're not my girls, but you're my brothers and sisters. Don't be average. You were made for better things. When you move off of the average, whatever that grid is, I'm going to promise you something. The enemy is going to come knocking. That's just what he does. So you can play it safe or you can live it for the glory of God. The choice is yours. Satan, in the end, cannot beat you. And so let's get to the end of it. His doom is sure, lake of fire and sulfur, tormented day and night there forever. Don't feel sorry for him. He is the, he is the uh, prototypical rebel. Every bad thing that has ever happened on planet Earth has come through him. He's at least the original source of it all. Don't feel sorry for him. Well, that great prophet of old, Mick Jagger, used to sing, Sympathy for the Devil. No, there isn't any. He is as wicked as wicked can be. It doesn't get any more wicked than him, and he deserves the lake of fire, and that's exactly where he's going to go, and he knows that, and he knows the clock is ticking, and it ain't have, doesn't have many ticks left in it, and so he is amping up. Do y'all see this in our generation? Do you see the fury and the activity of, of hell being amped up in our day? We have to see it, friends. We're not imagining things. So his terror will eventually be terminated. Verse 16. This is back in Isaiah. I love this. Oh, I love this. Those, I like the King James in this better. It says, those who see thee will narrowly look upon thee. It says here in the ESV, those who see you will stare at you and ponder over you. And look what they're asking. This is at the end of the age. Is this the one who made the earth to tremble? Who shook kingdoms? Who made the world like a desert and overthrew its cities? Who did not let his prisoners go home? Watch this. If you will allow this prophetic kind of template to lay over this passage, which I think you, could, you should. I think we're on good ground doing this. At the end of the age... 
where the redeemed of God, the blood-bought, the ones who are saved by the, the blood of Jesus Christ, the eternally pardoned, the justified, the forgiven, the, the redeemed of God, I picture it this way. He's been cast into the lake of fire, and, and I don't, this is probably not accurate. This is just the way I picture it. I just picture us having a, a look down into hell, and there he is, and we're saying, is that really the one who terrified the nation? Is that really the one who made the earth to tremble for the entire history of humanity? Is, is that the one we were worried about? Is that the one we were afraid of? Friends, this is what faith does. Faith goes to that scene, takes the reality, and brings it back to where you are living today. In other words, if that's his reality, and it is inscripturated, he's going to burn, he is defeated, he will not rule, he will not reign, he will not get the throne. If that's the reality, then by faith, appropriate it. Don't wait for it. Appropriate it and start living in victory now. Stop backing down. Stop fearing. Stop trembling. Stop giving him glory. Stop, stop telling everybody, oh, the devil's on me, the devil's on me. Well, in the name of Jesus, get him off of you. And if you can't, then enlist some people. I've been so weakened sometimes. A, a few weeks ago, I, I'm, I'm now convinced that some of what I went through for 10 days was nothing less than spiritual warfare. I had a friend of mine that is really, just really outspoken about what he sees in spiritual realms. And he just called me up and he said, uh, we were just in our garage and God told me to get on my knees, pray for you because the devil is trying to kill you this week. Now, I didn't know how to accept that. I was like, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, brother. I don't, he doesn't play around. Chad's, Chad's real serious about this stuff. And all, all I know is that um, on the next to last night, about 20 people gathered in, in my front yard or in my side yard. I was in bed. I didn't see it. Amy showed me pictures, but gathered in, and for the first time in seven or eight days, because they prayed against the wicked one. They prayed for my restoration. They prayed for my health. They prayed against whatever was going on. And for the first time in six days, I was pain-free for about five hours. And then two days later, I was back up in the pulpit here. So, so all I'm saying is this. If you're not strong enough, there's some people that love you and will come to your side and will be uh, Aaron and her. When you can't lift up your hands, they'll lift up your hands for you. But I, the, the, I guess the main point is this. I know I'm rambling a little bit, but I think this is a season of reversal, Isaiah 61. I think it's a season of reversal. I think, uh, I, I think that literally, Dustin and I were with Chad on Monday night, just a, a dinner. He came down from Greenville, and he said that this is a season of revenge, that God is going to execute vengeance on the enemy for all of the affliction that the enemy has put on God's people. And he spoke some very empowering words over what God was doing right here. And friends, listen, you're going to believe somebody about something. Somebody's got your mind. Somebody's got your thoughts. Why don't you just go ahead and believe, A, the word of God, and then believe people that believe the word of God and tune the rest of them out. Love them and serve them. Just don't listen to them anymore. Man, I got like nine people who are like, yeah. <laughs> All right, let me, let me, let me finish this. This, is, this. My hermeneutics professor would fail me, but I'm having fun. All right, his shame will be everlasting, verses 18 through 20. All the kings of the nations lie in glory. What does that mean? That as Isaiah is saying, all pagan kings get a glorious burial, each one in his own tomb, verse number 19. But you're cast out, away from your grave, like a loathed branch, clothed with the slain, pierced by the sword, like those who go down into the stones of the pit, like a dead body trampled underfoot. You will not be joined with them in burial because you have destroyed your land, you have slain your people. And then this little footnote, may the offspring of evildoers never more be named. That's not happy, that's not happy Bible right there. That's, that's, not, that's nobody's life verse, I don't think. That's not one that we hang in our kitchen on a, on a nice little tapestry. Um, but it is speaking to the reality. You see, in the end, the one who exalted himself got cast down. Think about this. He wanted the highest place in existence the throne of God and the dominion over everything. He decided he wanted it and he went for it. And he epically failed. And he was cast down, but not just to earth. That was, that was unglorious enough or inglorious enough. He was cast down to earth. And yes, he's the prince of the power of the air and he had some, some leeway, and some power. 
got the sovereign God of heaven will use the devil just to accomplish the sovereign God's plan. I mean, God, God, God's not intimidated by the devil. The devil's going to run around and do his thing. God says, I'm actually going to use your rebellion for my glory in the end. And so not only did he not get the throne, but he got cast down to the lowest hell. You, my friend, those of you that are in Christ, you have received by grace what he tried to steal. I'm not talking about the throne. You're not God. You're not going to sit on God's throne. But you are seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So positionally speaking, you are on the throne. You are in Christ, hidden with him, and you're going to rule and reign. You got it as a gift. He wanted it by rebellion. He forfeited it. You were granted it. I'm going to tell you something. He is a raging, jealous, hateful entity. That is why he comes against you. He comes against you because as a citizen of an everlasting kingdom, you will be eternally partaking of something that he's been eternally denied. It is your connection to the kingdom, to the king himself, that fuels the uh, opposition of Satan against you. Do not back out of the kingdom. Do not back down from pressing further into the kingdom. The safest place you can be, spiritually speaking, is pressing into Jesus more deeply, more deeply, more deeply. The reason why some of you are going through what you're going through right now in life is, is, is not because God's displeased with you. It's the exact opposite. He's beautifully pleased with what you're doing, what you're trying to do, what you're saying no to, what you're seeking to embrace. God is deeply pleased. The enemy hates it, and so he will fight against you tooth and nail. And it, much like Job, it's a test of your willingness to trust God in the midst of it anyway. And I believe each and every one of you can, and my prayer is that all of us will.